We're here in Przemysl, Poland at the Przemysl Fortress Museum, which is at one end of the Carpathian Mountains. And on the other end of the Carpathian Mountains, a hundred years ago, Romania joined the First World War in August 1916. Now, you may well be wondering just what that country was doing while the rest of Europe was at war during the preceding years. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about Romania prior to its entry in World War I. The three regions of Wallachia, Transylvania, and Moldavia have a long history of foreign occupation, going back to the Roman era. These territories that formed the modern state of Romania have sometimes been independent, but were more often fought over or occupied by more powerful nations. On January 24, 1859, after a unionist campaign, Alexandru Ioan Cusa ascended to the thrones of both Wallachia and Moldovia, effectively uniting them as Romania as a vassal of the Ottoman Empire. Now, he introduced sweeping reforms designed to modernize Romania and drag it into the 19th century. But this brought him into conflict with the landed aristocracy, and he was forced to abdicate in 1866. Political chaos ensued until the throne was offered to Prince Karl, Karol of Hohenzollern, a Prussian prince with Bonaparte family ties. He accepted, and Romania became a hereditary constitutional monarchy, though still nominally under Ottoman control. In 1877, when the Russo-Turkish War began, Karol saw opportunity for Romania to break that control. Romania gave the Russians permission to cross Romania to attack the Ottoman forces. The Russian offensive stalled in Bulgaria, though, and the Tsar asked Karol for men and assistance, which he provided. Eventually, the Turks sued for peace, and the resulting Congress of Berlin redrew the map of the Balkans, among other things, creating an independent Romania. This new free nation instantly came into conflict with Russia, however, as Russia demanded southern Bessarabia, which had passed back and forth between the Russians and the Ottomans over the years and offered Romania impoverished Dobrogea, which had last been under Romanian control in the 1400s. This forced exchange inflamed public opinion in Romania and culminated in the signing, in 1883, of a secret treaty that bound Romania to the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, and the construction of defensive works aimed at stopping a future Russian invasion. That treaty was sort of a double-edged sword for Romania, though, since it also stopped Romania from any sort of intervention into Austro-Hungarian affairs, most particularly those in Transylvania, which was 54% ethnic Romanian, only 30% Hungarian, but ruled by the Hungarian minority. In fact, in 1892, when the Romanian National Party of Transylvania petitioned Emperor Franz Joseph for equal rights and treatment, the petition was sent unopened from Vienna to Budapest and the signatories were all arrested and sentenced to prison terms of up to five years. If we fast forward to 1912, we see that Romania by then was something of a rising star. It was still mostly agricultural, but industrialization of the Prahova Valley had spurred new growth, and Romania had an economic surplus of around 5% of its GDP. Now, Romania did not fight in the First Balkan War of 1912, but had really only remained neutral because Russia had organized a deal between Bulgaria and Romania, offering Romania the fortress town of Silistra for remaining neutral. After the war, Bulgaria refused to go through the deal, and this, as you may imagine, royally pissed off Romania, who threatened to take Silistra by force, but were stopped by Russian diplomatic intervention. Bulgarian relations with Russia cooled off now because of all this, and the Bulgarian-Russian alliance was cancelled June 9, 1913. A week later, Bulgaria launched a surprise attack on Serbia and Greece without declaring war. The goal was to grab as much land as possible before the great powers could end the conflict. And so, the entire Bulgarian army was committed to the invasion, despite the threat of a possible Romanian invasion from behind. 
Well, on the 28th, Romania got assurances from Austria-Hungary that the latter would not intervene if Romania went into Bulgaria. The Romanian army mobilized June 3rd and on June 10th invaded a totally undefended Bulgaria. Romania invaded with 330,000 men and Bulgaria had an army close to twice that, but all were engaged in fighting in Serbia and Greece. By the 22nd, the Romanians had linked up with the Serbs at the Bulgarian rear, and this, coupled with an Ottoman advance into Bulgaria, forced Bulgaria to sue for peace. The peace talks concluded with the Treaty of Bucharest in August, which stripped Bulgaria of much of the territory they'd gained in the First Balkan War. Right? Romania got not only Silistra, but the whole of southern Dobrogea. But the campaign highlighted the shortcomings of the Romanian army, particularly the lack of equipment and ammunition, the quality of the officers, the disorganization of supply lines, and the inefficiency of the medical corps. Combat casualties had been virtually zero, but 6,000 Romanian soldiers had died of cholera during the brief campaign. It's nice to recognize your shortcomings, but most of the same problems would still beset Romania in World War I. The Second Balkan War had brought Russia and Romania closer together, with the Tsar even making a state visit and a planned royal wedding between the future Romanian King Carol II, King Carol's grandnephew, and Russian Grand Duchess Olga Nikolaevna. Now, this fell through because the prospective spouses detested each other. Another effect of that war was to turn Bulgaria into a retributionist state seeking revenge on Serbia and Romania, which would help propel Bulgaria into joining the Central Powers in the First World War. So, the First World War began, and what would Romania do? King Carol revealed the existence of the secret treaty and proposed to join the Central Powers in the war. But the treaty was a defensive one, and Romania was not actually required to go to war since Austria-Hungary was the aggressor. Remember, the king was of Prussian origin too, and a cousin to the Kaiser. Public opinion, however, was staunchly Francophile, and that included most of the Crown Council, who opted for armed neutrality as a compromise between the king and the government who wanted to join the Entente. And then, on October 10, 1914, King Carol died with no male heir. He was succeeded by his nephew, who became King Ferdinand I. Unlike his uncle, who never forgot his Germanic roots, Ferdinand declared instantly that he would follow his country over his family and would reign as a true Romanian. His wife was the very British Princess Marie of Edinburgh, granddaughter of Queen Victoria, but also daughter to the Russian Grand Duchess Maria Alexandrovna, who strongly and kind of obviously urged joining the Entente. One thing to realize here was that the Romanian army was not only under-equipped in terms of guns and ammunition, but since it hadn't joined any side of the war, it had real problems getting weaponry from abroad, and Romania did not have a big weapons manufacturing industry. Still, Romania did eventually join the war, as we've talked about in our regular Thursday episodes. Prime Minister Ion Bratianu carefully negotiated the Romanian entry into the war, because the last thing he wanted was a repeat of the 1870s when Romania had to cede land to Russia. So the treaty formally bound the Allies to recognize Romania's right to annex Austro-Hungarian territory that was inhabited by Romanians. This was a pretty good precaution because earlier in the summer of 1916, the Allies had signed treaties that would prevent Romania from participating in any post-war peace conference as an equal. In fact, Russia didn't really want Romania to join the war because a neutral Romania guarded Russia's southern flank, but an active Romania would mean putting that security in the hands of an unproven army. All of this posturing delayed the Romanian entry into the war by two months until August 1916, which was pretty unfortunate timing, since the Russian army was in a bit of disarray after the enormously costly success of the Brusilov offensive over the summer. The Romanian battle plan was called the Z Hypothesis, which is a really cool name, and it was to comprise a strategic offensive into Transylvania with a strategic defense on the southern front. The offensive was to proceed for 30 days, at which point there would be a decisive battle with Austria-Hungary. Now, I'll go into all the battles in the weekly episodes, but I have to say here that this 
was a very optimistic plan. It assumed that an offensive could repulse the Austrians before they could get German assistance, and also that the German, Bulgarian, and Ottoman forces south of the Danube were too weak to pose a threat to the southern front. Well, as we've seen, each and every time a new country enters the war, it's with a blind optimism and faith in its army that usually borders on fantasy and sometimes crosses those borders. We'd like to thank Alexandru Bukor for the research that went into this episode. If there's a specific topic about the First World War that you'd like to help with the research for, please get in touch with Flo, our social media guy. And if you want to see what was going on in Bulgaria before the war, you can click right here for that. And you can like us on Facebook, and you can follow us on Twitter, and you can check out our subreddit. And don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time and every time.